levels of sophistication around their sales process, uh, what they define as um, uh, what's right for them in terms of their, their sales force. Um, but the, the clients that are being, trying to be a little bit more strategic, going to a higher level uh, sales team, quite often uh, want, <clears throat> we've seen, I suppose we've seen a bit of a change, we want to do more with less in the last four or five years, I'm sure everyone's been exactly the same boat, uh, not necessarily uh, replacing people, um, giving up territories, uh, trying to get more out of, out of the stone. Um, therefore, you want actually a high quality person. Um, the days of the, just the purely relationship representative, for example, are pretty dead, really just rocking up and talking about the footy on the weekend, having a cup of coffee and saying, oh, by the way, you know, do you want an order? That's, that's done and dusted. The thinking salespeople, sales professional, can understand the concepts around current and potential. The number of times that I ask candidates the question on how do you determine what the potential is of your territory or your market, you'd be surprised how many have not got answers. It's, it's astounding sometimes. Um, really simple stuff and that, uh, that, that at a much simpler level than this about what's the potential of your customer, your client. How do you determine how much more you can get out of them? Are you at the top of the game? Uh, the number of times I'm sure you've all sat around and had uh, sales people say, oh, look, I think, you know, nah, there's nothing more there. You know, we're, we're getting as much as we can out of this lot. Well, how? Why? Gut feel. Putting us some basic science around. So those sales people that can sit down and say, right, well, we're only really getting about 10%. Why? You can deal about that later, but understanding the concepts around current and potential to feed that mark, that information back up. So in a national sales or, or, or state sales position, you can understand when you're justifying your boss, where are we going and what's the rationale behind it instead of just plucking figures out of the air. So having that really simple methodology, even in building, without needing to conf necessarily confuse or over complicate it from a salesperson's perspective. It's, it's really quite important to be able to identify those individuals that have got those pretty simple capability. Quite frankly. Um, so, so I've undertaken this exact process. So these these two um, two sets of letters, CV and PV, were completely foreign to me um, about two and a half years ago. But um, I want to use to give you a bit of an example from two different businesses, and you know, maybe that may. Um, reflect on where you guys might be at with your businesses. But um, current value, both businesses, um, one was a company called GWA Group, which uh, essentially owns the brands Corona and Dorf, so bathroom and kitchen products in the building industry. Um, current value, they've got really good systems that can articulate the current sales, you know, everyday sales for every customer, whether it's a plumbing store or a builder, or whoever it might be. Um, and then the second business, the one I'm in now with Canada, pretty good as well. You can kind of see every bike or every piece of clothing that sits with every store. So the current value in both those businesses was kind of easy to ascertain and get your hands on. So the second part was the potential value. And if we go back to GWA Group, a um, little bit of a, um, I guess a sort of similar line to what Duncan's talking about, is the actual capability of the individuals. I think the, but the biggest challenge was getting the frontline salesperson to actually think like a sales professional and as a business consultant rather than just an order taker who's a good guy. You know, good bloke can talk about the footy and all those things that don't mention. So it's a real switch. So I encourage you before you even undertake this kind of process to evaluate the capability within your sales team and recognise what levels you need to get various individuals to before you actually want them to walk into a store and have an educated business consultation conversation with a retailer or a, or a business about asking to get that potential value. Because it can be kind of seen as a little bit sinister. You know, a rep just walks in and, and, and every day of the week for the last five years he's been talking about products and so on and so on. And now he's walked in and he wants to know how big's your business, how many dollars do you turn over? Like that's, hang on a minute, where do you come from? So there's gotta be some sort of a, a skill and some, um, some capability built into the individual to go and have a great conversation that actually opens up the playing field that says how important it is that I understand how big your business is 
and what share my business is so I can then develop tactics to grow my share and grow my profits with you and ultimately hopefully grow your business too. And that's the line of thinking. The second part is, what do you do with this data? Like it's all good and well to have a rep walk in with a notepad or an Excel spreadsheet and he has the current value as determined by whatever sales um, analytic program you're running now. But then when you manually drop in another number, so currently we're doing $100,000 with you, Mr. Customer, and you're telling me you do a million dollars. Okay, quickly I can see what my percentage of my share is, but where does that information then go and then what do you actually do with it? And that's the, probably the next really important thing for you to think about. If you're gonna undertake this process, make sure that you've got some sort of a system which Glenn can certainly support you with, or one you may already have, um, I've worked with two CRM tools, one being Siebel and one being Salesforce. Salesforce for me is by far better, but that's my opinion and, and everybody's got a different view on how they work. But to be able to input that data and then be able to report from that data, then as Duncan talked about, you can begin setting your priorities and you can begin setting your roadmap for opportunities next month, next quarter, next year, if that's what it looks like but you actually have a home for where that data is. And, and I probably do align with Glenn's thinking that this is a once a year kind of exercise that you want to undertake. I think, you know, over the course of a year, a business will change. I think, you know, the two industries that I'm reflecting on, that's the sort of time frames. I don't think it needs to be quarterly. I don't think it even needs to be half yearly. You'll see the different shifts in business. The interesting dynamic in uh, the bike industry um, is the distribution challenges that brands within the distribution channel has. So a brand like Cannondale, we have a, uh, a distribution point here in Melbourne, um, in Richmond, or actually it's in Windsor, uh, so a, company, a little business called Swim Bike Run. Not through anything written down on paper, but just through kind of how it is, they have a sort of a pseudo five to 10K radius of bike stores where Cannondale is then not distributed. So they kind of own a little piece of Melbourne. Now, whether that's right or not, you know, it's, it's probably up for debate. Um, a business like Giant, they'll probably have more dealers and more distribution points because of their market size. They're probably close enough to 50% share of the bike industry. So they kind of need to have more distributors. But if you take on a premium brand like Canada, you want to have some sort of exclusivity. So all of a sudden, the potential value for stores within that radius becomes less. It's not as important. And you just need to then have an idea of what stores are good because one day you might have a conversation with Swim Bike Run and you might say, listen guys, we think our sales are underperforming in this particular region and we want to go and explore new opportunities for distribution. So the flip and the comparison of what I'm saying is once a year it is very worthwhile to know why, where are the opportunities if you wanted to make a call like that from a distribution perspective. So I guess the summary against CV and PV, I think CV is pretty easy to get hold of. Um, I probably debate, and I have debated with Glenn, whether you need to be at margin level. I know that they're, you know, we're all very profit driven, but a sales guy is probably more thinking about top line sales, whether you're calling gross sales or net sales, whatever, whatever your measure is. But that's a sales guy's thinking, and quite often you know, we will set a strategy quick strategy that says, you know, we're going to discount the price of this, I need you to sell more units or whatever you're selling. Well, a sales guy, that's what they go and do. They don't then think about what's the profit implications to that. So I personally believe that current value, CV, should be on net or gross sales, um, as I think also PV will be, because when you talk to a store, you're asking for what's your turnover, because I think it's pretty challenging for any sales guy to walk in and say, what's your profit? because the store's probably not gonna to wanna to give that information up. So like for like, in my view, I go top line sales to top line sales and that gives you a semi-direct comparison of what you're kind of comparing with. So that would be what my view on CV and PV is, but I can't underestimate how valuable it was when the, the sales guys in the building industry went out with a newfound confidence and capability of asking a question to a retailer about just how big is your business? And just how big are we within your business? That was light bulb moments for many reps who all of a sudden became valued business 
consultants more than just sales guys that walk in off the street. So it's a different mindset to consider. Great stuff. Anyone like to share your challenges, your uh, how you guys go about uh, tackling this uh, type of issue? I just know that uh, you know this this is a, an area that's not spoken a great deal in sales sales team environments, and uh, you know I just it's, it's like uh, it's gone, it's ready to be dug up, so yeah. It's, the more I hear about this stuff, the more I realise that there's been very few sales terms that, that use it, and those that do use it are probably very successful. That's a really good point. I also think that uh, for any of you that are in industries where you may have, um, in my industry, I have a lot of Chinese counterfeit product that arrives in the marketplace, and, and you don't actually really know who is the distributor. Everybody knows the brands, so if you're talking about um, you know, bikes, everybody knows that all the bike brands. But then there's a whole bunch of little brands that you will see on the street and you go, gee, I've never seen that bike brand before. And you wonder who it is or where it's come from. But you know that a certain store's got it and it's ranged. But when you go in there and you think that that little brand might only be 5% of their turnover or 10 you get a real big surprise when you think a store's only doing a million bucks turnover and he says, yeah, we're doing five million. You get five million. And then all of a sudden when you're getting into that conversation, you then learn, hang on a minute, this little Chinese brand that's poked its head up is, is delivering an, another 20 or 30% more volume into your store than I ever gave it credit for. So again, you get to, you know, all of a sudden you've got this newfound knowledge that you never had before, and, and almost a new competitor is found. So that's again where the PV can be really important. I think the other interesting thing is um, sales, in my experience, can often, uh, you know, you've got you know, dealing with other accountants and financial people and they don't have to actually get face to face with customers. Um, and it's easy just to sort of spreadsheet stuff and scribble and do all sorts of things. Um, as opposed to getting out there and getting some proper evidence to come back to the organisation, justify everyone's under pressure with your resources oh, we think we only need three or four or five, whatever the number might be, being able to have some sort of framework where you can justify the existence of your team. And perhaps more importantly, what we're noticing is everyone's really over this sort of last couple of years. <coughs> clients are really wanting things to happen. I'm sure we're all sitting there just all just waiting and we've had some good results maybe in the last six months or so. Maybe it's been a little bit patchy. Geez, I can really get some market share if I put some additional resources on. How do you justify that? And having some sort of framework where you can go and say, well, I've got some science from behind this, I've got some justifications rather than just just plug this figure here and I'll just tell, tell the boss, tell the board, whoever, what they want to hear. Um, you can't dispute uh, like this, uh, this framework and the, I mean, you can test some of the assumptions but you can, you can be challenged. It's not gut feel, again, there's a bit of science and, and data and maths behind it, which, is, uh, which makes it a lot easier for the, us or you to do the job. Yeah. Sorry. I mean, uh, just from a global perspective, a global organisation, um, the first place we used to start was with the import statistics, because it told you the total size of the market. Um, and from there, you could monitor what was happening year on year. Um, interestingly enough, because you're global, you can also then look at the export statistics uh, and see where things correlate and, and how that work together. And that often was what we would use as the basis of deciding whether it pays went for a market or not, but also it gave us the potential for a market that might leave or not. And that also provided really solid evidence if you then had to take it to a board for, a, uh, for getting funds or whatever was necessary to go forward. So that was always probably the easiest start point for the market if you've got that kind of big enough market. Um, strangely enough, uh, you found if you asked, often you could get breakdowns of those figures and a lot more data than uh, through industry associations and others and providing that sort of data as well. So there's sources and sources. <laughs> okay.
ground. I think uh, the challenge always is the degree to which it can be drilled down to the customer and that's the way the be. I think again, the conversations you and I have had, Guy, I think uh, you've shared with me that in your industry supplying into, into the auto aftermarket, import data gives you at least the, the size of the pie. It's then the degree to which that pie can be charged, okay, carved up. And you even have the challenge of the CD level. Yes, yeah, correct, yeah. We have, we have a lot of incorrect sales as well, so of course, uh, talk about it through rather than pushing through it. Yeah. <coughs> Other <coughs> comments, observations? <coughs> More stories? Wins? Any ideas with any groups? So I'll take a group like a Reese as a plumbing store. Um, and, and Glenn talked about trying to find proxies or just uh, assumptions. A lot of those stores as a, as a retailing store will have uh, gold, silver, bronze, or level A, B, C, whatever, however they want to segment their own stores. And it's usually done on volume or turnover. So as a starting point, to give you and your people some confidence in being able to achieve success to get data, certainly at a um, PV level, Having a great conversation with a retail group and asking them just to give you a proxy. So, you know, a level A store does million dollars plus. Level B is 500,000 to 100 to, to a million, so on. Can, you can use that as a nice starting point. Um, and, you know, a decent sized group like a Reese or a Trade Link or something like that, they are able to give you pretty good data. Um, and, and, and that usually reflects then when you start to put independence or, you know, going to the mass market. Good. All right, let's move forward then. Um, so cost of sale, cost to serve, the third of these so-called six tranches of data. Um, we like to see a sales organisation do a little bit of work extraction from data from the finance system that will allow uh, the, the allocation of the direct cost to support the sales people, how much in uh, basic uh, remuneration, uh, tools of the trade, uh, bonus incentives, you know, the direct cost to support the sales team. Um, plus the overlay of the indirect cost, so sales management, uh, any internal sales, tally sales, customer service team that are also supporting the same customer base that the sales execs are visiting uh, to allocate that as well. And even what you might call service support, quotation departments, technical departments, who are also directly um, having communication and dialogue with the same customer base that the sales execs are visiting. So we would consider that a fully loaded, if you like, mechanism of costing sales and costing serve in relation to the customer base in question and the sales team that's being optimised uh, as it's aligned to that customer base. And as I mentioned before, when you do that properly and you amortise the whole loaded cost for each head in the team, let's say you've got 28 reps in your team, so you allocate that total cost per each head in the team and then divide that by the actual visit rate that's being executed in the current reality. We quite often have uh, a situation with an organisation, we have a technical term for this, we call it the oh shit experience. <laughs> oh shit, it costs us $354 to park the car and walk up the driveway and knock on the door. And again, you can run your number against the so-called cross-industry standards. And again, my three-fold question, what do we look like? What does good look like? What could we look like? Um, and quite often, uh, we've had clients use that number as a real uh, recalibrator of the mindset of the sales exec. So that each visit, it's like placing a bet on the stock market. You get one chance at it, place your best bet, then it's gone forever. That visit, you've got one chance at it, it costs 354 bucks. How much do you need to get from that visit to pay for <coughs> the cost of that visit? Very important number. Glenn, Glenn or as our old colleague Rod McCallum would say, would you walk into that business if you were paying for that uh, yourself? Yeah. Beautiful point, yep, absolutely. Um, the fourth of these six trenches of data I alluded to before, it's just running some internal um, sales numbers, things like your head count, your visits per day, per week, number of days per week on territory. Again, we can give you a cheap list, it's fairly basic stuff, but it is important in terms of making the whole uh, sales of optimization work. 
Similarly, with your external market data, it's uh, getting the scope uh, around the size of your market. Is it in growth? Is it in decline? Um, who are your competitors? What share of wallet are they getting compared to you? How are you sized compared to them? Are you punching above your weight, on weight, below weight? You know, again, we can give you a set of questions to, to run your external market and competitor data. And then the final of these six tranches of data, so if you think about the involvement of the sales execs, next to none in terms of CV, may well require sales team involvement to get the PV, and Jeremy's given some very good examples of that. Sales execs not needed, sales execs not needed, sales execs not needed, all derived from other sources. Sales execs need to be involved in this. This is a very personal exercise. They sit down on their own and do it. It takes about an hour, Jeremy. It's not a long exercise, but if you set it up right, it can give you some very powerful information. I'm going to give you an example. Um, we call it time to task allocation, and it literally gets the sales execs to think about what they do, where they spend their time day in, day out, usually in a way that they haven't been forced to think about before. Um, and it'll start off uh, as kind of like a drill then. So how many days, per, uh, hours per month are you actually on the job or the tool, so to speak? Um, the way the survey is crafted allows then a first drill down to a level to say, well, okay, of that time, how much is office, how much is territory? Of the uh, office time, how much is face-to-face -face in front of customers, prospects? How much is in driving? And how much is in anything else that you do on territory? Office time, how much is that solo versus how much are you in the office with other colleagues, your managers, in meetings, whatever? And then the further drill down goes. Um, so with your face-to-face -face time, how much of that time is proactive, responsive, reactive, fixing up problems so on behalf of the customer? Of your drive time, how much is productive, how much is unproductive? Productive, I mean legally making communications on the, on the Bluetooth phone uh, devices. Breaking down the office time. How much of the office time, uh, solo office time, is value adding, value neutral, value destroying? Or even more importantly, why are we in the office when we're solo anyway? Why haven't we got the tools and the trade to do everything we need to do in between visits out on the road? Um, and how much of the other time spent with colleagues, managers, in meetings, whatever, is also value adding, value neutral, value destroying? You know, when it all washes out, the data washes out, it provides some very useful insights into your sales team productivity. And again, the question, what do we look like? What could we look like? What does good look like? You know, you can start to then put some real numbers around your classic uh, productivity drivers like your visit to drive time ratio. And it starts to show how much the sales team are operating in the service cycle. Again, probably fixing up problems in the audits, delivery or the service fulfillment process on behalf of the company and or the customer versus how much time are they doing the things you really want them to be doing, nurturing relationships, finding new opportunities and growing business. So there's just a little bit of a list of uh, the kind of sources that you would use to derive uh, these six tranches of data. And I think uh, I'm going to pick up on one of the points Jeremy made. So that's all well and good. You go through this exercise, you get the data, you validate the data, you maybe go through a couple of iterations to get it to a point where you've got a threshold amount of data and it's of a, of a reliable, um, a, a level of reliability. So what? What do you do with it? I'm actually going to finish for today because this is a topic that deserves a whole seminar in itself. But just to whet the appetite and at least address the question, so what, what do you do with it? Having two data points, CV and PV, supported by all those other things, your cost of serve and your other uh, data from those other six tranches, or the other four tranches I mentioned, allows you to put all customers onto an even playing field, which we would, in Excel language, call a scale. CB, PB, and by the way, these dotted lines here, this, the lower dotted line is actually the break-even point formulated by the cost of sale, cost of serve, cost of a visit that says, these guys down here on CB and PB do not and are not likely to break even to pay for the cost of minimum account level. 
showed up. Send your sales reps to go and account management. Find the lower cost form of looking after those customers. Again, that's another topic for next seminar. These other lines that you see here are all mathematical derivations of the six tranches of data coming together as little formulae and algorithms behind the system that are ultimately going to form the boundaries of segmentation. Tier one loyal, tier one cultivate. Tier two loyal, tier two cultivate. Sell as well as does, whatever you want to call it. So um, I am going to deliberately uh, close it off there and just have one more round of uh, discussion because uh, that's going to be my segue to hopefully invite you back next time because uh, that's like that and how that then feeds into your infield targeting and measurement systems is another story all on its own. But that's essentially why you are going through this effort of gathering this data. Again, panellists, observations, reflections, contradictions. Um, okay, so I talked before about my view is to have CV and PV as a net sales, gross sales. And I think that's because you need, I think you need to be very transparent with your sales guys, account managers and so on. But when you get to your sales leadership or your, you know, your kind of exec level where you're starting to then use this data, that's when it comes back to profitability. And that little line, that horizontal line at the bottom there um, becomes quite a confronting line because you look at all those little dots beneath there and there's a whole bunch of customer names there. Um, and it's at that point then you start to draw out those customer names. And I don't know if I'm sort of stealing next seminar, but you, you steal some of those names out of that bottom left-hand box there, and that will surprise you with the customers that you're servicing that actually you lose money by going and seeing. And it's at that point you can then bring it back up to a sales guy and educate him on this customer here, you're selling this much stock, we actually make this much money from profitability, how do we change the game? And that's another form of the uh, technical term that you said that you go shit home. And there will be surprising where you'll find how many customers that you think you're doing good business with because they're buying lots off you or buying a substantial amount to what you think justifies the number of sales calls. But the reality is you're either selling stuff too cheap to them or they're realistically not buying enough to justify the amount of times that rep is going to see that customer. And again, it also makes you confront the situation of um, that customer who puts demands on you to have a rep or an account manager in your, you know, from your business to see them every week. You can now go back and have an educated conversation to say, no, you don't deserve it, and these are the reasons why. So all these things add up to outcomes, and the outcomes make great business decisions that you know, rather than um, trying to do it off the gut feel, intuition, you know, you've got facts that support it. So it's, um, it's, it's pretty cool. It's a good process to go through. There's no doubt that this, this sort of methodology and a bit more of a scientific approach is, is really important. But if you don't have the cattle to do the job, the right cattle, yeah, you can spend a whole lot of money and you get really excited in the head office, uh, but out there in the, you know, on the, in the jungle, nothing's happening. So there is always going to be a certain amount of cynicism amongst the sales team. I've certainly experienced that in the past in a couple of organisations where we sort of adopted this sort of methodology and approach. So one of the observations I'd like to make is compared to other disciplines, accounting, production, you name it, sales is often a oh, lot easy. Um, one of the challenges from a business development perspective and from a recruiter is, uh, is, oh, we don't really need you guys, but we can do it ourselves. We, you know, I'm a salesman, I know how to judge people. Not always the case. Again, coming back to gut feel, um, knowing the right questions to ask. Um, I've, on the other side of the fence, I've used recruiters, I've, took, I've tried to do it myself when the organisation was too tight. You guys are paid to do what you do well and that's not necessarily running recruitment processes. So looking at your, your people, have we got the right people to do the job? Some people will, some people will be able to uh, go forward. This is also translates into the development of your team. Where is everyone? And you can use again data around assessment and I'm not, I'm not necessarily talking around um, uh, any sort of verbal, numerical, abstract reasoning uh, type testing. I'm talking about what's the profile of the team? 
what do they look like? Yes, we're all different, you know, uh, and I'm not even talking about things around, um, uh, you know, whether you're introverted, extroverted, in that mice bricks, which are very useful. How do we work together as a team? Where are our strong points? Where are our weaknesses? So if you're really managing your team properly, you understand everyone's strengths and weaknesses, how we counter each other, how we work together. What's the best way to get the, the best out of my team? Um, you know, Charlie's one type of person, Fred's another. We use a, a number of sort of assessment tools to get a, a, a profile picture. It's not to say you're right or wrong, it's just your, your behavioural preferences. And there's some really quite interesting specific tools around the sales capabilities. So you can have a look at your sales team and understand who's who's where, where do I have to develop instead of, so when you have your annual review you just don't come and go, I think it's looking pretty good or bad or what are we going to do differently and then, you know, I want a sales, I want some more dollars, thanks uh, manager, uh, well, yes, no, what have you been doing? So being able to determine, set goals for your team, both numerically and also from their personal and professional development can be really useful. You need to have all that right. And that's only the middle section. The start is what do we need? Determining what are the characteristics, what do we want a salesperson in our organisation to look like? What are the challenges of our particular industry? And, that, and each of your industries are different, so you might require different things. It's not one size fits all. So having collecting that data is really important. So knowing what you want in the first place before you start the process, very important. It's really challenging when the goalposts move to go through a recruitment process because the client might not have really understood what they want. We'll throw up a PD and that's what we need. Getting into it, thinking about what you really need to do, measuring that, perhaps analysing it and recruiting against that is really important. Not only for getting the right people into your team, then managing them to get the best out of them to enable you to actually attend them because if you haven't, it's probably a bit like herding cats. Good comments, observations. To your point about having the right talent, yep. uh, good salespeople typically know their numbers, and sometimes people are willing to share those numbers with sales management. Less effective salespeople either don't know their numbers yep. or are less inclined to share them. Yep. Can you comment about the effectiveness, sorry, well, the reliability? Mechanics of data and some of the challenges of that actually getting reliable data. Just the graphs that Glenn shared there, great in theory, but how do you actually get reliable data from people who are volunteering information and not only know or have the tools to collect it themselves? You're talking about your people getting that data or are you talking about getting that from your clients? Oh, no, I'm talking internal from your own account execs. From your, sorry? Your own account execs. Yeah. Your own self -made. Oh, I think if some, some have got street smarts and understand that and get it. Some, no idea. Um, every, quite often I'll ask the question, how do you go about determining, just about in every interview for a salesperson, how do you go about determining? And they go, oh, look, I'm going and yeah, build a relationship. All these cliches come out here. This, this is not good. Um, I think identifying if they, identifying what they don't understand, um, really important because then you can actually train and develop them. If they haven't necessarily been in an organisation where which regards sales training as important, they might not have all that capability. So sometimes people just need to be educated. This is what we need to do and this is why it's important. And if, if, uh, if you do it in, I suppose, in a collaborative way, it's not pointing fingers and saying, you're a you know, you're a plothead. Uh, people go, yeah, well, I get that. Just, I can do that. It's pretty easy those tools so um, if you know what questions to ask so to speak you will be able to steer them in the right direction um, I'm sure